Good evening. Uh, this is coming out on a Tuesday, and so we're saying good afternoon on this Tuesday. And so we're hoping that you've had a wonderful weekend and had a very good beginning uh, to this week. And so as we begin tonight, uh, we just want to kind of share with you very quickly about where we're going. Uh, this is our second week of dealing with questions concerning the Tower of Babel, which is found in the book of Genesis 10 and 11. And so we're hoping that people will want to get involved in this and it's something that you will be able to take away from, some information that you may learn, but more than anything, it will be something that challenges you in your walk with the Lord today. And so that is our prayer. So pray with me as we begin. Father, we commit this time into your hands and ask that you will guide this study as you would have it to go. And Father, it's in Christ Jesus' name we come. Amen. Amen. Week two, we're going to be dealing with questions three, four, and five. We're going to be dealing with three questions tonight three questions tonight, and so let's get to it. Just kind of a little recap. The significance of understanding the Tower of Babel events is to understand the mandate God gave to Noah and to his family. And it's a very simple verse. Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth. God wanted productive people that would put him first in their lives. He wanted them to begin the world again with godliness and holiness. He wanted people to grow in numbers. He, he wanted the, the world to prosper. He wanted the people to multiply. And God wanted all this to happen over in what we would call the Middle East, but from there go to all over the world. That was what God wanted. He said, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth. You've got to understand that that was the mandate of God. When we talk about the Tower of Babel, we might not understand a lot about what happened, the specifics, but what we need to grab a hold of was what God asked of Noah and his family and all those that would come from them. He asked them to be fruitful, multiply, and to fill the earth. Question number three, when did the scattering of the people occur? Keep in mind that when we're answering these questions, we're going to dig to a point that it's going to cause us to kind of branch out and it's going to be teaching us something new. So we ask that you please understand that. So here we go. When did the scattering of the people occur? There's a renowned chronologist. His name is the Archbishop James Usher. He says that the Tower of Babel events occurred 106 years following the flood. Now, I could go and explain this to you, but it's just a bunch of facts and it's just a bunch of history. It's, but let's just kind of take it from there. This guy's renowned for having come up with correct dates. And this is what he says. But there's one other thing that we can go to the Bible and find, and that is in Genesis chapter 10, verse 25. There's a guy, his name is Peleg, P-E-L-E-G. And this is what it says in Genesis 10, 25. During his lifetime, the people of the world were divided into different language groups. Now, that is from the New Living Translation. It's from the New Living Translation. The word Pelig 
means divisions. There are some people that try to say that what is being said here in chapter 10 is that things began to happen on the earth. But see, they had already happened. When the mountains formed because of the breaking of the waters beneath, when all that began to happen, it was at the flood. So it's not talking about there were things happening on the earth. It was talking about the Tower of Babel. And it was talking about when the languages divided the people. Tradition has it that Peleg was five years old when the events of the Tower of Babel happened. He is the key there. Other people have said it was a little bit later. So traditionally speaking, we are very safe to say, and I know we talked about this a little bit last week, we are safe to say that it happened 106 to 130 years following the flood. Now, that leads us to a passage of scripture that is found in the book of Genesis, chapter 6, verse 3. Chapter 6, verse 3, and this is what it says. Then the Lord said, My spirit will not put up with humans for such a long time, for they are only mortal flesh. In the future, their normal lifespan will be no more than 120 years. Now, remember what I was saying earlier, that a question can lead us deeper. Well, here's the deeper part. This verse is one that has created many different translations. The one that I read you is the New Living Translation. It's the Bible that I normally preach from. But a lot of people, a lot of translations look at it a little differently. Look at it a little differently. When you're reading the genealogies that is found in Genesis 11, where it's talking about the line of Shem, which is one of Noah's sons, to Abraham, we find that men lived longer than 120 years at that time. But in verse 3, is it talking about the specific time? It may be. If it's talking about a specific time, what that teaches us is it teaches us that the Lord said, I'm going to give man 120 years to repent of their evil before I bring the flood upon the earth. And I have always believed that. I have taught that. But as we're doing this study, I, I wanted to, to find out deeper. I wanted to find out more. I wanted to make sure that what I was teaching was correct. And I began to check with so many different commentators, different theologians. I began to read from them to try to figure out this little part. And maybe what it is saying is maybe translated in another way. It might mean that it could have took not only 120 years to build the ark, but it also could have meant that after the flood, the Lord was only going to give the people 120 years to do what he is asking and instead of destroying the earth he divided the people with languages a hundred and six to a hundred and thirty it's right in that range where 120 falls and I hope that you're sitting here going, okay, Todd, I know that you're about to come out with, even though that doesn't matter, what that teaches us is. And so 
Here it comes. What does that teach us in 2020? It teaches us from the very beginning in the book of Genesis that God is patient with mankind. It teaches us that God is merciful. He wants no person to be lost. Hell is not going to be a place of people that God didn't want to save. Hell will have people in it that chose to go the way that God was not. As Max Licado has said, and as I have said very many times since I've read that a number of years ago, Max Licado says, God does not send anyone to hell. Man volunteers. What this is teaching us is that God doesn't want anyone to perish. Look to the sacrifice of Jesus. His death and subsequent resurrection was not for a segment of the population. It wasn't just for the Jewish people. It wasn't just for the people that is over in the Middle East area. It wasn't just for a certain number of people. Let's leave it there. Because his death and resurrection was for everybody. For all of mankind. And do you realize that? that the Lord is still being patient because it is still the day of salvation because he hasn't called times up yet. Today is still the day of salvation. And when I read this in the Tower of Babel and I come across that question and it just keeps taking another right turn and all of a sudden I come to the realization that this is teaching us of the mercy and the love of God. That he would give people opportunity after opportunity to follow him. Which now leads me to say this. If you're not where you need to be with the Lord. You can be. And you can be right now. All you got to do is just turn off this recording. And get down on your knees. And just talk with God. Just like you would talk to a friend. You can pick me up another time. But understand, the Lord is waiting. He gave his son for you and for me. He paid sin's price so that we could have life. I bet you didn't think you was going to get that from the Tower of Babel, did you? Question number four. What did the tower look like? Now, here's what's interesting about this. I, I'm going to pick this up again and get more a little in more detail, maybe. But it just seems to me this is just the su succession that we need to follow. So, what did it look like? Well, we don't really know. It's not there anymore because that was a long, long time ago. Think of it this way, 2,242 BC, BC. Think about that. That's when that would have happened. So it's not there. But what were some of the other things that we know of that they could have looked like? Now, I know that I'm probably not going to pronounce this correctly, so I'm going to spell it for you. There are buildings that are very massive in their width. It's like you're building up this great big rectangle. And on top of this great big rectangle, you put another rectangle that's not quite as big. And then on top of that one, you put another rectangle that's not quite as big. And you do that for however many 
levels that you want to put on it. Most of these, and it's Zergarats, S-I-G-G-U-R-A-T-S. These Zergarats go way back. These preceded the pyramids. So they look a little bit like a pyramid, but you know, a pyramid is real smooth. These had levels. And we know that these dated way, way back. And just so you know how big these things were, a lot of you may have heard of the historian Josephus. But when you think of Josephus, what I want you to know about what he thought of the way they look. He said that the bottom of these was so large, the bases were so massive that it made the height that they eventually turned in, it would distort it because the base was so massive. When these things were really tall, but yet the base was so very wide. And when we think of these things, we think of this building that was made and they were used for all kinds of different things. Sometimes there was a temple that was put up on them. Uh, sometimes they were used for different other things that's going to lead us into question five. But what I want you to understand is that they would rise up kind of like a pyramid. You see, in the New Living Translation, it says it reached into the sky. Now, another word for sky is heavens. I, uh, I don't know if they were attempting to get to the Lord or if they were trying to do something else. But you see, the fact still remains of the original mandate. Be fruitful multiply, fill the earth, the whole earth. That leads us to question five. Question five. What was the purpose of the Tower of Babel? Or if this was a Zergarat, what was their purpose? The Bible says in Genesis 11 that the purpose was to make them famous and to keep them from being scattered. But some theologians, many theologians, believe that there had to be more to their purpose than that. So what could some of the other purposes be? Number one, and even the historian Josephus said this. He said, it was built to survive another flood. Now, here is the problem with that. The reasoning is sound. But they knew the promise of God. And the promise in, we find in the book of Genesis 9, verse 11, is the Lord said that he would never destroy the earth again with water. And the sign of the covenant was the rainbow that we still see in the sky today. So it doesn't seem like that would be it. Well, maybe it had to do with idolatry. But this is, doesn't sound really like it's going to have anything to do with that. Remember, this is only 106 to 130 years after the flood. Please keep in mind, Noah was still alive. Remember, he was 600 years old when he went into the ark. And remember, he lived to be 950 years old. So if you do the math, you find out that Noah is still alive. Noah is still the righteous preacher. So surely they understood that idolatry was wrong. Well, let's go to something else. Let's go to the fame thing. Because we know that that's what we find in chapter 11. 
one of the two things so that people would know who they were, their fame, and so that they wouldn't have to scatter. Well, if you go with the fame thing, you realize that everyone that in the world was living right there. They didn't want to scatter, right? So who are they trying to impress? If everybody is working together to build it, is it supposed to be a monument for later? Years later is people that comes along at that time, are they supposed to be impressed with it? So that doesn't sound really good either. So let's, let's go to something else. How about for sacrifices? Could this be true? Yes. We know that God instituted sacrifice all the way back in the time of Adam and Eve. Because remember, Cain and Abel, um, God accepted Abel's sacrifice, but he didn't accept Cain's, and Cain became upset, and he killed his brother. Sacrifice had already been instituted by God. Now, has the law of Moses been given yet? No, not yet, but God himself had instituted sacrifice. And we know that when Noah come off of the ark, one of the first things he did besides turn the animals loose was to offer a sacrifice. So for sacrifice, yes, it could have been. But do you realize how big this altar would have been? It couldn't have just been for sacrifice. All right, well, let's go to something just a little bit different. How about for the study of astronomy? Now, we realize that um, even in Jesus' day, astronomers were counted and high esteem. And the reason they were is because they dated things by the things that they saw in the sky. They would give direction by things that they saw in the sky. And so maybe it was for astronomy's sake. A lot of people worship the heavens because of the sky and the stars and the sun and, and all of this. I, I don't really, we've already covered, you know, idolatry, but the astronomy thing, you know, it could have been, but that's still not that high, relatively speaking. You understand? So let me give one more shot. How about it was built for burials? Now, we know that in the pyramids they buried people, correct? We know that. And we know that these were before the pyramids. So we kind of look at it and go, you know, maybe, well, that could have been it. Uh, we do read that uh, Noah's wife um, is not in a lot of the later writings of the tradition. Uh, we know that, and it has been brought up that maybe it was built as a memorial to her and a place for her to be buried. But you see, it, it couldn't just be for burials. So we come back to the only sure thing that we know is what we read in chapter 11. The people did it because of the desire for fame and so that they wouldn't be scattered. You know, we stop and we think, and could it all have been because of pride? You see, folks, pride has been a thing since the beginning of time. It has been a sin that has haunted mankind forever. God talks about pride in the word. You know, we need to realize that, yes, our accomplishments may be our accomplishments, but we have those accomplishments because the Lord has given us the strength and the wisdom and the understanding to accomplish the tasks that have been at hand. So no matter what you may have done, 
we still give glory to God for what has happened. Could it have been that pride became such an issue that it caused the dispersion of people? I don't know. But it's hard to imagine that the people there in the valley or the plain of Shinar, which is in Babylon, which is in Iraq at this time. It's kind of hard to believe it was anything else. You see, folks, the Bible teaches us plainly all the way back in the book of Genesis. And if it was pride, was that not a sin that every person struggles with at some point in their life? That's why it's important to do Bible study, to dig, to find out what's behind what we read. I hope that this has been very informative for you and I hope that it has caused you to be challenged because what we need to do is we need to stop the cycle of sin. We need to stop because that means if it's a cycle then it's going to be picked up by our children and then it's going to be picked up by our grandchildren and so on. You see, we learn this because we study the Word. And we learn this by going all the way back into the book of Genesis. I hope that each of you allow the Scriptures to speak to you. And that studying something we might not study very often, how it has and speaks to us even in our world today. We hope that you have a wonderful evening, and may God bless.